welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. I'm opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Hello, moviegoers. Welcome back to Popcorn Talk Network. Today we are doing Anatomy of a Movie for the movie The Walk, directed by Robert Zemeckis. We have a full panel today. What's up, everyone? I'm your host, Marissa Serafini. Joining me, I have... Hi, guys. This is Sarah Stratton. Hi, this is Amanda Fields-Bennett. Hello, this is Joe Braswell. Hi. <laughs> hello, sorry, hello. Joe's Joe, are you back. here? I'm here. Sorry. Hey, here I am. Where are we? Popcorn talk. Back by Not popular demand is Joe. We can't, you know, we can't get rid of him. This, yeah. this guy. <laughs> but welcome to the panel, Amanda. This is your first anatomy. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about The Walk. And that was beautiful music uh, for your Elise. Yes. yes. Thank you to Alan Silvestri, who composed yes. that. Yes. Um, yes. For, for this so this good. version for the film. Mm -hmm. But overall, what were your quick thoughts? Joe, how about we start with you? Uh, on the film? Yes. Yes. What uh, did you think? I loved it. I loved it. Looking, looking forward to it for a while. I know it's been in development for a while. I think Bob Zemeckis had it 10 years ago. He had an animatic of mm -hmm. it he brought into uh, to Fox back with, when Rothman was running Fox and brought it in in pure animatic version and was like, this is what we want to do. And it's one of those things that Zemeckis is famous for in that uh, the technology is not quite where you want it to be. But even then, he thought like he he's ready to tell the story in this particular way. But they passed on it. Rothman said, like, I, he was afraid to make it. And so later, 10 years later, as a producer, Rothman finally said, let's make that movie. And they did. I thought, I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was beautiful. I thought, I love this. I love the documentary. I love the story. I love what he did visually. And um, I was, sub, that's how it made Chinese, IMAX, 3D. I was fully immersed. Nothing bad to say. All right. Amanda, how about you? I, I also saw it in IMAX 3D, and it was exciting to see a film that was in 3D for a reason. It's not 3D just because it's a trend mm -hmm. at the theater. It, it, it was made in a way, and Robert Zemeckis chose this story to tell in 3D because he knew that he could bring that element to theater goers, that surprise, the gravity of all the things that were going on. And I love the simple way that the story was told. I love that yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, all this extra stuff, that it stayed focused on... Philippe Petit and his group of friends and the way that he learned and was taught. It was really beautiful and I liked the way um, that the arc went with the story and I, I just love the way that they selected certain moments to tell. Alright, so I love when this happens. I get to be the negative person on the show today. <laughs> Alright. Uh -huh. um, so, I did not see it in 3D. Maybe oh I'll, my maybe God. I'll tell you. No. Oh, oh, no. no. <laughs> Dead side of the panel. You Sorry. Didn't. First of all, you obviously you don't know me at all. I get headaches from 3D. Oh, okay. I can see the like the frames moving, so right. I tend to stay away from 3D because it, sure. it mm -hmm. bothers me. Um, even not in 3D, the best part of this film for me was the experience of watching him on the wire. I did feel very up there with him. I thought that the ability for his mechs to grab the height of the towers was thorough throughout the film. Even when you weren't on the buildings, the scope he would get from looking at them from the ground, from pulling out and looking at them from different viewpoints of New York. I thought he always kept the grandeur of the towers very alive and very apparent. Um, but for me, I could not walk away saying that I absolutely loved this film. I loved that it was able to get a visceral reaction from me when he was on the wire. But up until that point, I was not truly invested in the story. I felt like a lot of the characters and friendships I didn't get to know enough of, weren't memorable enough. Um, some of their story arcs, to me, got left off in the end about why they were even included when they... It just... The relationships it didn't feel fulfilled to me. Um, I liked hearing Petite's story, but when it came to the story around it, 
um, his friends, his girlfriend. It just wasn't enough. And I also didn't like... I wasn't drawn in enough into the... There was three very quick visual styles at the beginning of the film. Like, he used three different techniques that didn't reappear enough for me throughout the film to make it a visual standard. He went from using kind of three filters for in the first 20 minutes to mm-hmm. really letting go of them for the over two-thirds of the film, except for the um, Statue of Liberty shot. And that shot also didn't really grasp me in. So I loved him being on the wire. I love that part of the story, and I love his story in general. But as a movie, I wasn't in love with the relationships, and I, it took me a while to get invested. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, what Fair I, enough. Yeah. I, have, I have some questions to that. Yeah. But okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. What I applaud Robert Zemeckis, they, we know his past films, he's a great director, and he's directed many great productions. But... Uh, this is his first 3D, and he purposely did it in 3D. And I think using this technique, if done if, uh, done well, can be very effective. And and I feel there were some shots in this film that were purposely for the 3D effect. I thought it was great. It didn't take away in, in ways it did add, and I felt that the 3D helped evoke a lot of different emotions that we're actually supposed to be feeling rather than just watching it but actually feeling it. Right. Um, overall, the I like the visual spectacle of it. I agree with Sarah. The character development was not there. There was maybe one arc, maybe. But, I, I mean, the characters were fun to watch. We saw why they were involved, a little bit how they got involved. But, I, like Sarah's saying, I wanted to know more. Right. And we didn't spend enough time with the main people who actually helped pull this off. Right. We, we spent so much time with the lead. Which, I mean, the audience is supposed to. He's the protagonist and driving the film. But everyone who was also involved, I felt like they should have got more airtime. I mean, that's fair enough. I, I, I don't disagree with either of you, what you're saying about you know the development of the other characters. I just sort of feel like there's, a, there's certain benchmarks you expect from a Bob Zemeckis movie. And I think that mm-hmm. like one of the things is, and one of his cause knocks or his criticisms and his strengths is, he's a visual storyteller. So mm-hmm. with all of his movies... It's probably 50% of the movie is, is about what you're seeing and how you're seeing it. Like, he's going to show you stuff in ways that either you've never seen before or camera angles you've never seen, whether they're, whether they're done digitally or not, or something what you're going to see on the screen visually is something you've never seen before. And that's mm-hmm. like 50% of the experience for me. And then the rest is sort of how his how those characters usually... Uh, usually men, and you know, usually there's, there's always a dude protagonist, but how they populate um, that... There's always, always, also always usually some version of himself. You know, that's nothing about his movies, but how they populate that world. And this, the construction of this movie was very much like a heist film. So if I knew going yeah. in that like this is a heist film, it's this one guy, he's pulling off the job, he's getting the people together, and then you go off and do the job. In heist films, you really don't really get to, you don't need to know about the accomplices as much because the focus of the heist film is usually the job itself. So mm-hmm. if I looked at it through that lens, I was okay with the construction of the movie and, and, the, and the lack of development of the characters. Um, I did want a little more from the relationship, from the love interest, but it's also difficult when you're talking about a real relationship, you know, and I know that their um, relationship wasn't as, I mean, they, they didn't stay they together, it wasn't as lovey-dovey as mm-hmm. maybe And she wasn't as supportive. It wasn't conventional. And she wasn't as supportive, at, so. I, yeah. At this juncture, at the Twin Towers walk, she right. wasn't that supportive. She had been supportive in the past, but they made it very like, I'm just here for yeah. you, and I would have liked to see a little bit more tension. I mean, they're talking about all this tension in the sky. Mm-hmm. Like, why are we not getting more of that on in the character relationship? Especially because it is true and right. it is part of the story. Um, and I found myself, it was even to the little things. Like, that's huge. His, his female love who he brings from France with him to complete this coup, that's a big relationship. Sure. But even his secondary strong relationships... Um, if you talk about the photographer, who, like, yeah, that like that was enough. Mm-hmm. And what happened, like, there was no end for his story. Like, he got brought on to be a photographer, but we never got to see any of his photos. We never mm-hmm. got to see the 
pay off for any of these other characters and the effort they put in. Would you have rather seen that? Would you rather see like that development rather than like getting to like the whole time you're like watching them like get to the lock, get to the towers. I mean, in, in a way, I wanted to see more of yes, we got a lot of the personal perspective from Philippe in in this film, but I kind of wanted this would have been a great opportunity for the film to actually go to the character and see what their person what their perspective was on it and how much they were involved like what were their thoughts you know like we got a little bit like this guy is crazy from them but that was it i wanted to see maybe if their perspectives and how to go about pulling this off i think as a director you have to make a choice how you want to tell the story and like you were saying he is a robert zemeckis is a very visual director and so for him i think he's always had this ability to do heartwarming stories, very touching uh, films with special effects. So the special mm-hmm. effects don't take away from the story, but they just add to it. And so, yes, I mean, I did, I did want to know a little bit more about some of the other characters, but I think ultimately you wanted to feel how Philippe felt. But I didn't really feel that or get extremely engaged. And I was extremely engaged when I was, but that didn't happen to, for me the last 40 minutes of the film. I think, and it's a two-hour movie. I think my favorite like, relationship was him and his teacher. Yeah. Rudy. Rudy. Papa Rudy. Papa Rudy. Yeah. For me, that fulfilled a huge relationship like storyline for me. So mm-hmm. I, I was pretty satisfied with that. So I wasn't feeling like I was missing too much because I think that the story that... Robert chose to tell was that relationship. Yeah. Like how he saw him and saw this talent in him and brought him up and gave him his secrets. And I love how it's brought back around how he's like, now there are secrets and he gives him his money back. Yeah. Well, so, I, I like that. Yeah. I love, I, I, for me, at, at growing up as a dancer, it was very, I related to that so much because I had so many people in my life that were like that. And so just personally, that I was like crying because it's such a beautiful thing to have someone teach you their art and teach you the way that you should go and then accomplish it and they're so proud of you and just I have a question on that relationship because I really like it and I love Ben Kingsley which is probably another Amazing. reason that I got invested in that relationship of mm-hmm. all of them pretty quickly mm-hmm. as well yeah well, he always um, classes up the joint I, yeah sure. um, <laughs> right. I did miss something though I think I just must have not been paying attention but he gave him the brown circular case. What was it? Well, no, it was yeah. a, that was a, that little thing was a, it's a tape to measure. So it's, oh, like, it's okay. a tape measure thing. It's like so basically it's like a chalk measure. You do it and you pull a thing and you snap it and it helps. Oh, make so a it's like line. what they use Gosh. in baseball. Yeah, it's, well, it's 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 yeah, it's just, it's just basically to, yeah, like be able to make a straight line and make sure that things are. Okay. Yeah, it's, like it's a little, a little chalk measure thing. Okay. okay. I just so. like had I, I knew didn't it was know that his, either. but I didn't yeah. know what it was. Yeah. And I thought they were gonna reveal it by the oh. end, and I was like, I was like, what is? It? I actually didn't know what it was either, and I thought, was that like the safety line just in case? Like was oh, that like yeah. the I don't know like the. That's a, a good little, point. They didn't really do a good job. It's sort of like the assumption is people know what that is, and and yeah. I had no idea. World I did, where everyone didn't and know. the audience still knew at the end of it. It was like okay, it's safe, right? And then nothing bad happened to it, but we'll still I don't know. And okay. I wonder if like maybe it was, that was a measure. Now that you say that it was a measure, maybe that's how he drew his perfect circle for so long, maybe. or like something. But for oh, me, I was like the circle. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. I was like, what what is this thing? Right. I know it's important, but I have no idea what it is. So before I forget. I realized that they never really brought this around. Uh, the, you know, all along, Philippe was saying, don't ever walk on the wire unless you check both sides personally. Mm-hmm. And I knew that they were running out of time and he didn't have a chance to check the other side. And they didn't really scare us enough, I think, with that. I think there was an, a missed opportunity to say more about how he didn't get to see the other side for himself. Right. Yeah. Or thank and, you to his friends for that he was able to trust someone enough to do it for him. Like something that mm-hmm. yeah, was left off. Yeah. I, and I realized that glaring missed opportunity as well. And, and, and while watching, I was like, he never ran to the other tower to check it. Mm-hmm. And then when he was actually walking on the wire, we'll get to all that. But when he's walking on the wire and you, we see that one of the um, 
<laughs> yeah, upside down. That, it was the, upside down. The, the, the Cavaletti. 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 The Cavalettis was <laughs> upside down. So, and I thought, oh, maybe t- this was one of the technical mishaps that made right. him like shake and whatnot during all that. But I'm glad they didn't spend so much time on what could go wrong when it, right. when he was actually doing it. Yeah. I, I also yeah. think that just, I mean, before we move on to it, like in a, in a meta sense, I think talking about like how he told the story and what the story is. Like there's there's a couple of ways to look at it. Like there's one very cynical way to look at it, which is like, like this guy's kind of a dick. First of all, this guy's not a good guy. Like F- F- Philippe is kind ah, of like a, kind of an a-hole, and and he goes and he's doing this thing that's really dangerous and illegal, and he's very sort of maniacal about it. And it's kind of like it is like a heist film, but he's not like this. He's not really a hero. He's more of an anti-hero than a hero in some ways. But there's another way to look at it, which is he is this really guy who had a dream and he did this really cool thing, which is the way Zemeckis told, told, told the story. Yes. He also yeah. told it in this sort of, with, with that intro at the, up top, with, with him on Statue of Liberty, it was done very much like a fairy tale. Like, let me tell you the story of this wonderful guy who had a dream in New York, and I'm this beautiful guy, and I, all I did was, <laughs> since I was a kid, I had this dream. And it's like, you're a crazy dude who, <laughs> you know, like, there's this couple. So I, I like the way he chose to sort of tell us as a, sort of a, as, as a parable almost. And then use him as a hero with a dream, and so you, that's why we're invested in him. But if you zoom out, there's a lot of people who think you know Philippe is kind of like a not, you know kind of a crazy person. It was <laughs> it was really interesting to me that um, how they chose to make him a narrator, right. being that he was of the same age, same wardrobe mm-hmm. as throughout the movie. Like typically, if you do see some sort of first person. Um, narration that breaks the fourth wall, it's normally by either an older self yeah. or mm-hmm. it's like the shot actually really reminded me of the narration um, from from Moulin Rouge yeah. where mm-hmm. you have someone on a pedestal kind of overlooking a city. French again. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. but that is a person who is removed. It mm-hmm. is a watcher of the scenario. This It was really interesting to me that he did choose to bring um, the Joseph go to I just like slurred all my words. <laughs> what, what was it? Which um, name again? Yeah, that. <laughs> but that no, guy? Joseph Gordon Levitt. That they brought him, same age, same wardrobe, same city yeah. to narrate his own story. Um, I, I don't know if I. It didn't bother me watching it, but I wonder that now looking back, having missed things from okay. having yeah. missed things from relationships, I wonder if it would have added more for me if they did put someone with him or in that role because it was an interesting technique that I hadn't haven't seen too much of, but I wonder if that added to my lack of relationships because so much was either on his present story or his narration. Yeah, of the story. my question is, Amanda, I know you have something to it's say, okay. <laughs> but um, for the narration, what did you guys think of their usage of narration in this story? Did it bother you? Did it not, Amanda? I loved it. And I love that they chose to have him on the Statue of Liberty on the flame because that is France's gift to America. Mm-hmm. So it's like he's a gift to bringing his gift to America. And I was like, oh, I just lo- I love the significance of that. The Symbolic. cultural. Su- yes. And I'm all about those like symbols and metaphors and movies. So for me, I, I, I was like, this is really cute and charming. I didn't expect it to keep going. Um, but yeah. I but I. I feel like this is one of those narrations that didn't take me out of the story. It's a fine line. Oh! <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I think, I mean... Very punny. The, I, the, for me, like, but bottom line with that narration, that choice is it was a very specific choice. Like, it's, it's like again, there's, there's a few ways to tell this movie. You can be you can be more hard, sort of like real life, you know, uh, biopic, and you can have you know, so the biopic style. You can do, um, you can have an older Philippe, re, you know, rem- reminiscing about the time, I mean, talking that, to a younger type of like Walker. That's like the very stereotypical yeah. way yeah, to yeah, do there, it. There's so it's many like different very, ways to do yeah. it. But mm-hmm. I think I think what he was what he was going for was to get the audience to buy into this as a fable a parable and mm-hmm. also as like a man with a dream. I think that mm-hmm. him on the Statue of Liberty sort of personifies that like I'm this man from Paris again mm-hmm. with a gift to America like like the Statue of Liberty uh, and I'm also uh, a man with a dream and, and New York is in the background and the towers mm-hmm. are right there and this is my dream. Oh. I think the whole idea of that is sort of get you into this sort of parable mode. So mm-hmm. I think the, 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 the tone of the film is somewhere between the sort of you know fairy tale parable and the, and the heist film. I think that if he I think walking into the movie like that's what I want to do, 
and taking those two um, constructs, those two genres, and mixing them to tell a real life story, I thought it was a great idea, and that that, that was executed. If if you buy into that, if you're there's, there's an argument like, well, he should have just did it as this, or maybe it'd be better. Then there's mm-hmm. an argument to be made there, but I think for what he did, I liked it. I think some parts of it were effective. Yes. At the beginning, it helped to draw the audience in, and I saw it as like just another way of narration and storytelling because we know that this film is based on the actual real <laughs> documentary Man on Wire mm-hmm. from actual Philippe. Mm-hmm. And so I, I saw it as this is just another way of how he's addressing everything that went on, but it was more his inner dialogue still speaking to us in narrative form. Um, I. I liked it throughout the movie, but it got to the points where I felt like, okay, it's a little too much. I mean, you, uh, was it you and Amanda that said it didn't take you out? Yeah. I felt mm, there were a lot of moments it did take me out. Like, I didn't need this one line. Like, I can understand, as an audience watcher, I can understand what he's feeling right now. Right. I don't need you to be like, okay, I needed to cross the line again. It's like, oh. we can tell from the... From the Breath looking, the did there. Yeah. <laughs> from from looking and watching the performance from Jesse Gordon Levitt, you can tell he wanted to already, and he's like, and then we cut back out of such a grand moment in the movie. We were to cut back to the narrator to be like, I had to go back. It's like we, as the audience mem- watcher, we knew he was gonna go back. I think the narrative little moments just back at the Statue of Liberty, it makes it more like a play. Almost like, well, in a play it would be a different person. So mm-hmm. maybe that's what you were thinking. Maybe it would be more fun to have maybe a different voice. But it, I think that made it more theatrical for me. And I think it had like a kind of a little charm and a wink to it. Mm-hmm. I and mean, I, I, I when I was watching it, I actually grew to like it more and more as I watched the film. Um, and it wasn't that when I was watching the movie, I was engaged. I thought that the humor they had in his speeches... Um, I thought his delivery of it was really clean and clear, but for me, it was coming out of it when I realized what I missed in the film and what didn't get me invested, that maybe that could have been an opportunity for them to put it there. Because I left the film wanting more relationship, and I'm wondering if that's because so much time was solely spent with him doing his own narration. Oh. So well, that's that's a good point. I get it. it. To me, it just speaks to like the way into the story. I mean, mm-hmm. the story, the story, the story wasn't about the relationships. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, and maybe mm-hmm. maybe that's a movie that we want that we want mm-hmm. to see. But this this isn't really about. It's not the, the, it's not about the wife. Hollywood it's not about the accomplices. It's not yeah. about any of that. It's about him, and it's about the walk he did in the towers and how he did. So you want to find out who this guy is. Cu- then you should have shot this shot this movie in forty minutes and done the yeah. last min- forty minutes of him being up on the wire. If that's all you're trying to tell me, v- mm. v- very true. And I think that you know, I mean, it's I, I like the way it was told. I'm just gonna say that. No, I, mean, I, I, I do too. I mean, I, I think I, think we're, I, I, think we're I was board. happy with it. I think maybe maybe the 3D is what throws you over the edge. Well, that's another that's 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 point I was going to ask you because I think that for me, it's back to the whole visual stylings of this. Mm-hmm. What I just was not, I could not get over was how beautiful the movie looked. Yeah, it was every, just an experience. Right. I mean, before we even got to the towers, like just how the depth and how that, I mean, like like you said, it's, it's really great to see a movie that actually uses 3D, but it's not as a gimmick only. So yeah. this didn't have it a couple of moments of things flying in your face. It wasn't a movie about things flying in your face or like mm-hmm. you blinking a lot. It cable was really, falling in your face. That, that, Ooh, yeah, that, that moment, was yeah. so exciting. That was one. They're like two That's gimmicky moments. That's a particular moments. shot where yeah. they're especially for 3D. The mm-hmm. two moments. One, I think, one, I think a bolt flew by and actually ducked. I remember that. And then, of course, <laughs> the cable thing like that was you know mm-hmm. but yeah. I think that most of, mostly this was about depth and about like mm-hmm. you know scope and even all, all the stuff in Paris was just beautiful and all the stuff in the fields and in the lake <sighs> before they even got to New York City so really just it, it, as a device as 3D as a device to be able to take go from what Paris was and how small his world was to be able when he gets to Manhattan and to see the vast you know canyons of these of Manhattan with these with these buildings with way off in the distance through the depth of 3D the towers are back there and then that was really uh, just wonderfully, wonderfully 3D, and then of course, obviously, all the whole. I think it was like 25 minutes on, actually, on the tower, on the thing. The the 3D was spectacular, and I think that I wonder anyway. That's my long-winded intro to ask you. Like for me, I couldn't even imagine not seeing it in 3D. So, and you're saying that that stuff still worked for you? Um, definitely being on the wire still works for me. The tower height, like when he was looking at from below how they would um, there's a camera shot where it goes from him leaning his forehead up till you get the spin of the camera up back down to yeah. him leaning his head like that still works for me um, even 
different parts of the city when they were reflecting on the towers worked for me. What didn't work for me as well, which you mentioned, was the earlier scenes in Paris. Right. But um, it wasn't that alone the visual didn't work for me. It was how quickly it moved, specifically from the narration on the tower to there was a portion of the film when he was being introduced as a character. He's riding his unicycles before... And it's in um, black and white. It's in black and white with little bits of color. color. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes to... Um, kind of like a dreamlike, yeah. warm, very warm, mm-hmm. dreamlike state, and then later we get into very crisp, clean colors. Like when you're in New York, it is very colorful and very, um, like everyone's wearing floral prints, and it's clear sunny days, yeah. and mm-hmm. it had clear images. If you looked at photos of these, like they'd be beautiful. But for me, just the beginning, his visual styles changed very quickly, and then it stuck to one visual style or two visual styles for the remainder of the film. And I just thought that that was, um, it took me a little bit longer to get invested because I wasn't sure if we're going to be changing visual styles every two minutes. I think that, mm-hmm. go ahead. Oh, I like the way that they did that because they were painting a picture of his past mm-hmm. as like how he came to be a wire walker. Mm-hmm. So the black and white and how he came to meet his sometime girlfriend. Uh, that was beautiful for me because it really set the tone and set the scene. And it was okay. I was on board and on the ride with mm-hmm. him going to these different colors, these different emotions. I think it was kind of like painting a picture uh, with emotions um, to kind of give you the hum- more human side before you just see all the technical wonderment mm-hmm. uh, later on. So you kind of get a feel of like, oh, this is how it was for him when he was a child. This is how it was for him when he first was on his own and he got kicked out of his house and he had to figure out how to be, you know, a performer on the street. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's that element of like, okay, now we're on the street. It's very black and white. It's concrete, even though it's Paris. But that that to me doesn't make sense because he was on the street, even in color, still working on the street. Well, for me, I mean, for me, I I think that it it kind of speaks to what I was talking about about the two different movies and the tone. Like this Mm -hmm. was a parable, and there's a heist movie, right? I think Mm -hmm. that obviously, for me, the the stuff in France and the stuff, the 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 flashback stuff, Mm -hmm. the early stuff. Is like it's all about setting the tone of the mm-hmm. sort of fairy tale tone. I mean, that, that's, okay. I think that's the black and white was able to do. Like, ah, uh, this is the the romantic the romantic Paris as you know. Mm-hmm. And this I just guy, thought of something else. Sorry. Then, go ahead. It reminds me of also a mime, black and white. Right. That's, 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 that's true. We did white. have a mime right. moment. We, yeah, did. we did. With Danny. <laughs> but it was, yeah. it's very much like the tone. You get to get the tone of like this is a a flashback and b this is a fantastical story you're about to. He's she's, he's retelling the story in almost a parable like way. Mm-hmm. I think that that what he's trying to represent visually. Visually, and then just just the, 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 at the beginning, I think that like uh-huh. there was a transition from something that was really like sort of stylized to mildly stylized, and then sort of once the movie caught up with itself in theory, gets once it transitions out of that point and gets into the heist movie, mm-hmm. then once we get to the heist portion of the movie, it becomes we're in New York and we're, we're getting accomplices in this. And heist. see, yeah. for me, I guess there was That's sorry, Marissa, I just um, cleared. Um, well, for put. for me, it was like. <sighs> What what I didn't see that you saw, or seem to have seen, um, is that what part was flashback and which part wasn't. Because for me, I think you could argue that the whole thing is technically a flashback from the narrator. Yeah. Well, it's a story, he's telling a story. I, mean, yeah, I, I think flashback's the wrong word because I think the whole thing he's telling, yeah. like, let me tell you a story. I mean, it's just the mm-hmm. whole it's thing a is. Because for me, the only time so. that goes really far back is when he sets up, he goes to the circus tent, sets up his rope, up until right. the point where he gets kicked out by his father. Right. That point really seems like the flashback to right. me. And the visual styles still weren't caught up enough, or right. um, I guess clear enough to, like in, in sections or time or evenly spaced for, for me to really understand. But I'm glad it works for you guys, because yeah. it's, it, you know, it's a yeah. movie. It, and like, I'm happy might, to hear it, your thoughts, because it's opening up a whole different viewpoint of the film that I didn't sure. think right. about. So and I, like, I didn't really see it as much as bothersome as you did, Sarah. I saw mm-hmm. it as more so two complete different worlds that he was mm-hmm. in. He had the France life, and then he had this new, clear opportunity life. And that's how he saw it in America. Mm-hmm. And I saw it as just... And for the audience perspective, these are two completely different worlds, two different views and mentalities that he has, even he's the even though he's the same person. One thing I noticed too, and I'm not sure if they talked about this, but um, their portrayal of New York also was very 
um, idealized and in, in, in the way the way it looked in it because New York in 1973 was a shithole like it was horrible and um and, and, yes. and I mean really like you know 74. that unrecognizable 70, 74. 73 and 74 yeah I mean I think it just I just I just watched again uh, the French Connection which is you know in 1973 I think and it's yeah. like I was just watching like Gritty. God. I remember how 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 horrible it was, you know, even in movies and television and everything else and film from like nineteen sixty to like nineteen for like two two the year two thousand, right? Mm-hmm. But anyway, the point is that but their New York at the same time was this almost like this Oz like mm-hmm. place because they're coming from Paris to Ooh, be in this like place. That. And it's very like in the towers represented mm-hmm. something. You know, at the time when towers were built the you, people in Manhattan and in all over New York were like these these are ruining the skyline. It's like these horrible monsters. Like they're terrible. Like we hate these things. Like we hate them. We hate them. We hate them. And then they even mentioned like you know now we look at the towers differently. Now we can't think of anything but the towers of being like these majestic mm-hmm. you know things. But anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. Their treatment of New York so sort of spoke to the whole parable fantasy thing as well. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like this one tower in Paris that's an office building, and it, everyone in Paris thinks it's an eyesore. And, and it's so it's interesting how instead of seeing the towers as an eyesore, Philippe was like, this is so beautiful. Right. I see this beautiful opportunity. And can we just talk about the emotional element of seeing the towers again? Yeah. I mean, the yeah. first glimpse, I was already like almost in tears. I, I'm almost in tears talking about it. It was so beautifully done and it was so emotional just to see them again and see him up there in such a moment of joy instead of a moment of pain. Right. Um, and yeah, the- it, it was a whole other element that, for me, I think I was I was feeling so emotional watching this film that like I, I maybe wasn't noticing all these little things about the different characters because I was so taken away with with how beautiful it was done and how and how real it looked. I, I agree, yes, let's talk about that. Because we know Zemeckis, as a director, he's really good at m- evoking all these emotions, and especially in storytelling. And, and I just love this story in general. We know it's a real story based on a real man, mm-hmm. but I loved how this is a positive story about the World Trade Center. And mm-hmm. as we know, because back then, this was like a new opportunity. New York is building, and it's this dream come true for this man. And he, in a way, he always thought these buildings being built were for him. It, it was for his dream to be accomplished. So, and then, not to jump too far ahead, but like even the last shot of this film, there was a long, slow, slow fade out on just the towers. And the and, reflection. And the reflection. And I loved how it made me as a watcher be walk out of a theater being reminded that the World Trade Centers, there is a positive story to it. There, there was hope. There were dreams there. And it, it's sad that everyone we know with 9-11 that, you know, they were unfortunately destroyed. But it, to remind America and just remind the world that when we think of about these towers... There's, there shouldn't be constant negativity around it. it should, there, should, there were positive things that came out from those twin towers. Mm-hmm. I agree, and I think that that all just kind of goes together with how you started with um, the tone of the piece and how they created it. And I think that not only was it visually presented in the very colorfulness and um, cleanliness of New York depicted in the film, but it's also in the soundtrack, which we entered in a little bit here. There's yeah. a lot of kind of a whimsical version of classical music. I would say that's how I took away it. There's also um, very happy, joyful, like jazz music throughout mm-hmm. the piece. And I think that all adds to the fact that they did want to make this a very um, dream scenario. And while we feel the danger from visuals, we are still constantly reminded it's not, we are not sucked into a he could die feeling as you watch this film you are sucked into he has a dream and that's created by how they i think how they created the look of the city and really what for me a lot that i that was the sound in the music as they around him and i and i think what's great about this film it leaves new york on a very positive note not that i'm saying there's negativity i don't like a negative note about it but like this is a positive story that happened in here in U.S. soil that Americans should know about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think to add on to what you were saying, how maybe they were going to possibly make this film 10 years ago, I don't think that us as Americans 
would or the world would be really ready for that 10 years ago. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Might have been too close to too 9/11. I, yeah. It was really close. Was, he also bought he bought the rights to the story before Man on the Wire came out. Yeah. So yeah. he had Which the was rights. 2009. He, oh, so he yeah. had the rights to the book. He had yeah. the rights to 10 years ago. Um, yeah, back yeah. in 2000. Man on the Wire was, two, so, was won the yeah. Oscar in 2009. To reach the clouds. Yeah. Was yeah the so book, he yeah. had the rights on the book. And then I'm sh- first of all, I think yes, that was too soon. And on top of that, then the documentary came out. So how this is paced, it makes sense. And technology, that it comes out now. Right. And I think mm-hmm. overall with creating his vision, I don't know what he could have done back then because you'll never know. But right. I think in the timeline, this is probably one of the better times to have it. And 3D has come so far well, yeah. since 2000. I mean, not just, not just 3D, but just like just the, 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 the digital recreation mm-hmm. of the towers. Like this yeah. movie, the other thing about this movie, which I thought was fantastic, mm-hmm. it's like, it's like sixty percent digital, well, the entire movie, mm-hmm. and so it's like they're, they're, I mean, even the stuff in Paris. There's so many things that are digital that you wouldn't even think about, and I think that it's pretty seamless. I mean, I think that everything, yeah, everything I saw, all digital. Yeah, I agree. All. The yeah. buildings it's, it's, and everything just it's, wonderful. Yeah, and they did a lot of research about the the architectural structures of buildings in that surrounding area, yeah. and just in New York. I mean, the, in sky, general, the skyline was perfect. I mean, I was from just, that I time, just got back from New York, so I, and that was just like up. I mean, I was in the top of the rock and, and, and Empire State Building, so I had, I just, the, the view of the skyline was like fresh in my head. Mm-hmm. So to be able to see that view, I was like, this is exactly right. But I do want to touch on what you're saying about the towers. I think that, like, with no disrespect to the lovely Charlotte Le Bon or, or Ben Kingsley, like, the towers were like really the, the co star of this film, oh, right? Yes. So, like, they, they were like the actual, you know, you know non living, you know, non personified, like, co star of this film. And I think that, like, character. Character, mm-hmm. exactly. They uh, were literally the supporting they're, characters. They're def- <laughs> yeah, supporting yeah. characters. And I think that, like, uh, you know, that's how Bob Zemeck has treated it. And I think that you can tell in the love and care, the painstaking, like, love and care, they, they, they went to recreate these things digitally, like, from the ground floor to every floor. And you really get a real sense of, it really was a love letter to the towers and, and New York itself, but the love letter to the towers in that, even that first shot you see from the torch of, of the of, of, of uh, the Statue of Liberty, them in the background, how majestic they look. Mm-hmm. But once you got close up and just seeing, you know, what architectural marvels they were and what en- what engineering marvels they were, 110 stories of these two towers that were like at the time, it was, it was amazing. So the, I love the fact that he celebrated them as these as as the wonderful sort of marvels that they were, as opposed to these eyesores that they were thought of at the time, mm-hmm. even though he referenced it. And then once you got up there, the idea of sort of what that view that you know we won't see, why well, you can see the Freedom Tower, but you will. That view that mm-hmm. you you know few few people saw because yeah. only there for forty one years or whatever that like it was it's spectacular to be able to to, to see that and, and and celebrate that and then of course I didn't really get I didn't think of it like like you were thinking of Amanda the whole time I was like wow this is I was really just blown away by how real this whole thing looked yes. and how real the towers look. It didn't feel like a digital recreation. Not at all. But I didn't get emotional at all until that last shot, which was obviously like a big sort of like, you know, it was, it was a big... That you know, was when I really cried. Right. That, that mm-hmm. was, you know, it was, it was almost, you know, a tear-jerking moment. Like, so that's the mech is like, you know, really pulling the tears out. But, like, that last sustaining shot, it was like, it was almost, I don't know, it was like, uh, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, yep, there they are. Yep, the towers. But- ah, that's sad. There they go. No. No! no! <laughs> like, you're like, like a yeah. ton of brick, like, oh, It's like, no. uh, it's like in, 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 in um, Good Will Hunting, the whole, like, you know, it's okay. Leave me alone. Right. It's, mm-hmm. you know, the whole back and forth. That's how mm-hmm. I felt. Like, the longer it was up there, the more They're it was like, like mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, get out of here. Just you know. <laughs> but super effective. Embrace your feelings. <laughs> right, exactly. It was, it was super, super effective. I mean, a little, little heavy-handed. Like by by absolutely super gigantically heavy handed, but it worked. No, I don't think it was forced. I I think it was more very earned. That last that last shot, I was like, okay, he wanted the audience to feel something, and we yeah. felt it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was earned, but like that's my point is, yeah. he he, he earned, deliberately he wanted you to feel yeah, something. Yeah, it was a yeah. point that he right. and he the, earned it by how he did it. But it was something that worked. he right. wasn't like, oh, I'm just gonna put this in there and they're gonna right. be paid out just like, because it was like no. Remember. Right. Well, and the you reason why it was also so emotional is right before this, the last shot, uh, Philippe Petit was saying, oh, the the person who built the towers, they gave me a pass to go as much as I want. And yeah. Usually it has an expiration date. <laughs> and they wrote, 
forever. Yeah. And then it's yeah. Like, You're like, oh. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And then and to add to that, to, and the architectural you know, observatory up there as well, for um, Zemeckis has actually been to that observation tower. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt went on it. When he first went to that observation tower, he went on it the summer of 2001, wow. the year they were destroyed. Yeah. Like months before it. And wow. he, he moved to New York for college at that time. And he went very recently before, like right before they were destroyed. Wow. So like that was a burning memory for him. Yeah. And so for the, I mean, I haven't been to the observation tower. I can't imagine what that would have been like. I'm yeah. sure it was quite the view. And then to go back to the architectural structure, yes, there was a lot of digital remastering and whatnot that they had to do. But for the filming purposes of the actual wire crossing and whatnot, um, they built a soundstage and they built like 12 feet high the the top of both the twin towers, mm -hmm. and they actually for the space they they did the actual distance that so that was 140 a feet. I remember. Yeah, yeah 140 feet. And so. Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, did training. Yes, yeah, with um, Petit actually, right. Petit and he did, training. and he was able to cross the wire by himself at the end which wow. did help with shooting he did like eight eight cons days yeah consecutive wow. days of training well yeah. and can we just say or i'm just gonna say i love this choice of joseph gordon levitt for this role yes let's he get into the was the actors an incredible philippe petit i think honestly i don't know if you agree with me but i think he could even be nominated for an oscar for this you because think so. because he embodied who he was, he told the story. He got the physicality down. Maybe maybe I'm reaching with an Oscar, but he should be nominated for something. No, that that wig, the wig didn't help. Him, mm. No, no, the wig. The context. The wig. The wig. Context. 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 But I, lo I love. But the performance the, was outstanding. I love I the dedication that he had, yeah. and I and I, I don't know if you saw when he hosted Saturday Night Live. But he did his opening monologue, this is a couple of years ago, and he did Make Him Laugh from Singing in the Rain. Ah, and it's yeah. such a great movie. And I was thinking, I don't know if he was training for this role at the time, and he was just into the theatrical elements and the dancing and the balancing. And I'm curious to know like how much training he had as like a ballet dancer and the balance and the posture, because it, it was just so perfect. And I have to, before I forget to mention it, I love that they highlighted the fact that his foot was bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that was for me, but it gave it such a human, like, well, it's good dramatic connection. It, and for me, like, it's weird as a, as a performer, um, it's almost like you need that one little, like, thing that's wrong. Like the shirt, the shirt fell down, and mm -hmm. he didn't have the right shirt. Yeah, but I love that moment. It was <laughs> yeah, and he was like, "How am I gonna wear these?" So oh, no, and then he does it, and it's it's like he needed the couple of little things to be wrong so that it could be right. Right, right. I agree that it was an excellent device. Um, the because it is true that he stepped on a nail three weeks before. Mm -hmm. That is true, and that is how the crutches helped him gain access. Like, that comes from fact. Um, there was never tr any mention, really, of it bleeding through on his shoe while he was on the wire. So that was something yeah. they did creatively, but I agree that it, it added something... Uh, a spark to some of those images, not only by the color, because yes. it really stood out color. in general with the red, but because of the dramatic effect that he could slip, that it could, um, sure. that it could become more dangerous, especially as he kept going and it spreads. It's a visual thing to show also time passing. It was a really, I think, strong, small device, and that it grew out of fact, I think, dramatized, but it didn't hurt the story. It just added to it. Like, I just figured it, something out. Maybe it was an echo of the early black and white scenes with the pop of color. So then he's on the wire and it feels almost black and white even though it's colorful and he has the little red as the pop of color. And also just the symbolism of red, there's danger connotation to mm -hmm. it. So I think that that visual reminder that he is still human and there could be human errors that one slip he could lose his life. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that fact, yeah. And my other favorite, I think my, the thing that I took away the most from this film that I love was how when he was practicing on the wire in the uh, high wire in the circus tent and he fell down and he almost fell to the ground because he thought he was done 
and he still had three more steps. And how Papa Rudy made it very clear to him, no, you're not done. Those three steps will save your life or end mm-hmm. your life. Mm-hmm. And, and then he gets to that moment when he's walking in between the towers. And he's very calm and still, and he finishes it out strong. And then, and then that's also the moment that he chooses to turn around when he's hit that like three step, like he, like he could choose to keep going or turn around. And I love that that's a metaphor for your life. Anything that you're working towards or working on and you think you're almost done, you have to finish out strong. And I, I equate it to when I exercise and I'm doing those last three push-ups. You know, it's like, oh, I'm almost done, but no, keep going. Keep. Mm-hmm. I know that that's not exactly what they were trying to say, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, maybe. I, mean, I, don't, I don't disagree with that take at all. I think it's a good mm-hmm. take. I um. I, I love it. I, I like um, the metaphor that you're, you're, you're the metaphor that you're equating. I think that's good too. Yeah. Um, I just the back to performances. I, I think that like yeah, I think that Gordon Levitt was fantastic. Um, visually, it's kind of hard to look at. I mean, I was really thrown off by the hair, but that's just a dumb thing yeah. on mm-hmm. my part. Um, I, I was too, actually. I, I met him a couple of times. I met him a, f- a few times. But he's just, I think he's just a fantastic guy. But he's also an amazing. I think he's super underrated as an actor in terms of what he's. What he's able to do, the diversity of things he's able to do in terms of mm-hmm. you know the singing and dancing and like the different things he can play. I think he's uh, he's not unlike Matt Damon for me. Is that, that I believe him in everything. It's like super spy, sure. School teacher, all right. You know, mm-hmm. Tyrone Walker, okay. Like I be- like whatever he's doing, <laughs> like I believe it. And so, You're in. Um, and I, I think that like even you know even as a little guy, like you know he doesn't. I think of like little actors. I mean, I'm tall, so I look at these like little littler guys, and it's hard to like like the Tobey Maguire's of the world. It's like I'd like, like yeah, I'd like Toby a lot as an actor, but there's certain things I believe him in and don't believe him in. Gordon Levitt, he can do anything for me, right? and so I think he's a perfect choice for this, and he was a wonderful actor in this. I mean, she mentioned yeah. nomination potential. How do you feel? Uh, I don't. Do you I mean, think that? I, it, it's early, and I think there's a lot. There's a lot of that's why the, the field is, is wide. But I wouldn't be. But I think it's. I think it's nomination worthy acting. Whether whether or not he gets the nomination, who knows? I think there was some. I think his accent was pretty good. Yes. I think his French was was, was good. Yes. So I mean, I think <laughs> that like his you know be able to be able to act through that. It's really hard to sort of have your acting shine through a couple of dialects. So if you're able to pull off the dialects and then pull off the acting and pull off the character through the dialects, because sometimes you may have the character right and then you trip up on the dialect or the or the, or the accent, and sometimes you may have the accent perfect but then you can't act into the character. Yeah. I, 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 it was, so I, from, from an acting standpoint, my critique of him doing all of those things and letting that emotion come through, which was was all about. And lastly, the things you're talking about on the wire. By the time we got to the wire, we knew all the things that got him, all the things. It's almost like that. That is again back to the parable. The things he learned along the way, along his journey to get to that very moment, the the things he's learned from Papa Papa Rudy and the things he learned mm-hmm. in life and and his dad and whatever else and him getting to that very moment, like he's we've earned all those things. So every step every step he took, we're like, oh, we know what this is, and you know, and those last three steps were so meaningful. I think that he did a great job of of, of showing us that emotion, even and even that scene you mentioned with the with the turtleneck. Like and then yeah. you know, that relationship with with I can't remember the guy's name, but with the guys afraid of heights. That, oh my that god! Super, that was super touching to me. That whole yeah. like the guy was just like, yeah, I believe in you, and I hate heights, but I'm here for you, and you don't have your tail neck, but you're gonna do a great performance anyway. And that was that was a, that was sweet. That was really like touching to me. And so I don't know. I thought yeah. I thought the performance was marvelous. I, I think Gordon Levitt did a great job um, because he also did a lot of research for this film too. Mm-hmm. He yeah. watched Man on mm-hmm. Wire, and he you know he did the physical training with. Pet, petite, petite. Um, to actually do the wire training, and then mm-hmm. because he, can, he, Joseph himself said in interviews that throughout this training, it was Philippe who always believed he was very positive. He was a positive teacher and was always very enthusiastic and be, truly believed that Joseph could do it. And then by extension, mm-hmm. Joseph uh, actually started believing himself that he could do it. And sure enough, at the end of those eight days of training, he was walking on a wire by himself. So I think Joseph really put so much time and energy and research into this film. And also, even with the French accent and whatnot, while he was filming, he, he was surrounded by a bunch of uh, actors who, who and people who could actually speak French and the f- uh, real French people. And they were always saying to him, that we uh, that he needed like if he had critiques and whatnot they always like bluntly told him like no this is wrong that's wrong and whatever so sure yeah um, okay 
Uh, I there um, to that point. I I wanted to want to mention like the the little subtle thing that I loved about speaking of the accents and the performances that I loved um, was the if you've been around a lot of French people, it's the it's the way they they were having these conversations and this like. Uh, the arguments they would have, like they'd have conversations which seem like really horrific arguments, but they're really just sort of talking things out. Especially with uh, uh, the photographer and Philippe, you know, they're like, "You cannot do this. You cannot do this either." Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll do it. All right. It's, <laughs> it's like it's like a weird, like you know, but it's just the way they're talking. Even at the end, when they're talking about the, their what happened, and they're mm-hmm. all in the cafe and they're all kind of yelling at each other. Like if you don't know, you've been just screaming at each other, but they're having a conversation. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Or even the interaction between Papa Rudy and Gordon Levitt, and how. You know, it's a lot of yelling and hand waving, and and, and and I yeah cannot do this, and that's a lot. That that that's culturally like very very French. You know, mm-hmm. a way of sort of like the loud Their talking and hand waving and screaming, and then it's really just like, but I love you. You know, it's all love. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? And they they told Joseph that his French was pretty perfect. And yeah, like, his French was really good. I wouldn't know, but it, it, he fooled me. So there you go. Another uh, another moment, I, I know you want to get to something else, I just have to mention also, I want to talk about that moment that um, Philippe and the friend that was afraid of heights, they had to hide from the guard. On the like, beam yeah, over the, the shaft. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. That, and that really happened. That was such an important moment that I know it really happened, but I'm happy that they didn't like just skip over or, or right. go through it quickly. It was such it was such a important thing because it, it all could have just been like for nothing like they, they could have just they right. could have died doing that right i, I think oh. it was a great way i mean we were saying that we need to spend a lot of time with the supporting cast but we did get this really key mm-hmm. scene moment where it allowed the audience to m- remind us that philippe couldn't have done this by himself right. there's no possible way he, he had people doing cables back and forth and whatnot it, this was a team effort granted he sure. got the the last standing ovation and clap for that but this this was a team effort and i loved how throughout the film his girlfriend annie's always telling him you're not saying thank you you're not being appreciative to your team and this is a moment where he's like yes you guys are in this with me and yeah. you're you're sitting on this beam with me going through this whole heist coup. and that and that moment's also helped a lot by again not to this by the 3d i think the 3d really yeah. helped the tension yeah. that the depth of that of that shaft and all what was happening in that poor, and then the drama of the poor kid looking at his face, you know, like he knew. And he's a great <laughs> actor, too. Yeah. And I would say this about the performances, although we didn't get enough, maybe enough backstory or enough, like, you know, um, real, uh, enough of the relationships that we wanted. I will say that as little as we saw of those individual characters, they all did a great job of being fully formed characters. They did enough. Like everything, I can't remember the, the actor's name or the character, but the guy who is a New Yorker who speaks JP. French, JP. Like mm-hmm. I know everything Jean-Pierre. I need to know about Jean Pierre. Like from the little time I saw him, I get that guy. Like I get the the, the, the silent math, the, the, the math you know, guy. No, you want this like, one. You want right. this one. You know, even even the even the shaggy hippie guy. Kind of, I kind of get oh, yeah. who these guys are. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, everything that they gave them to do, they were able to give us everything yes, out of those performances. Fully formed that, characters yeah. based on who. Well, even the very little we saw. Them, I got an idea of who these guys were. I think that's just that's credit to the actor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Ben Kingsley before we get into box office and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. What, what did you guys think of Ben, Sarah? How about you? I always love yeah. Ben Kingsley. Yeah, I, I know you about him every fan. time he's on anything. I'm like, yes, Ben Kingsley. <laughs> just be in every movie ever. Yeah. You are a chameleon. Yep. Like, and, and I I love him, and I was like, Ben Kingsley, Ben Kingsley. Like, I don't <laughs> <laughs> know. French French. Accent. I was like, yes, it is you. I mm-hmm. see you under that hat. Um, <laughs> he's just oh, he's, yeah. he's yeah. just yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. I love him. I agree. I never. I really never have anything bad to say about him, he's except for the fact that he was in Ender's Game, and I was like, but was, even but that good. his character was intriguing in that. He's film. good. He's good in that. Crap. Amanda, how about you? I love that he gave so many different colors to this character. That he at first was like, get out of here, and then he saw that this kid had this like talent, and he gave him his tools that he needed to know all these uh, secrets. And he was and he was still hesitant to give him the secrets. He's like, no, you got to pay for the secrets. They're my secrets. And then, mm-hmm. and then, and then he becomes like the father that he didn't have. Yep. I mean, he has, he had a father, but his father was very his discouraging. Kicked him out. Yeah. His his mom was like, I don't know, I don't know. The carrots are cooked. Um, but I like I like that uh, Ben Kingsley was he was like that father figure who was supportive of his dream and encouraging, and it, it was just very uh, great because he was still assertive with him and still saying, No, 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 this is wrong, this is wrong. And and, and Philippe, it, 
if he didn't have that kind of foundation and that father figure, I don't know that he would have had the confidence to achieve everything that he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, agree. I said it. Ben Kingsley can you know, read the phone book. I mean, he's like he, when he shows he class he classes up the joint whenever he shows up, whether it's a bit part, whether it's a cameo, or it's a bit part like this, or whether he's the star of the movie. Like he's another guy like Matt Damon and like. You know, Jordan Gordon Levitt, I believe, whatever he's doing, um, you know, from Sexy Beast to this. And I think that what a testament to that is, I believe him as Papa Rudy a thousand percent because the performance was such that the way he carried himself and the way his chest stuck out and the way he walked, we didn't see this guy walk on a wire the entire movie, but there was no doubt in my mind this guy can jump up there and walk across the wire 50 times. Yeah, teach him right was, I, I, the, the, the way, I, looking at yes. him, I'm like, this guy knows everything there is to know about walking a wire. He can do it blindfolded backwards. I didn't have to see him do it, but the way Kingsley played the confidence and like, and he carried himself as a guy who can do, has spent a lifetime walking wires, and that's a just a brilliant acting job. I yeah. bet yeah. he actually learned how. I'm sure maybe he did. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even he even if he didn't he do it, he probably already knew how. He probably knew how. But and I, like, I and I, and I believe I, I was questioning. I was like, wait, is he from France? I know he's not, but he was <laughs> right. so good yeah. with the accent too and the yeah. language that. Was well, he supposed to be Czech? He's supposed to be Czech. 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 But yeah. then he made, he made mention of that, like that, like he's not French, but he was like you know, but he you know was speaking oh, French. He was back so back. very French. It yeah. was great. <laughs> and then also the last thing I'll say about that, that performance too, in addition to the confidence that you saw, like the the the, um, the competence, I should say, like you believe that this guy can competently do the wire. He was also. Uh, equally uh, showman, so you have that idea when he talked mm-hmm. about the whole thing about the presentation and how it and how you, you salute like, to uh, your audience. like all of that was just like you know brilliant. Oh, and you oh, can never lie to the audience. Never I love that. The yeah. that. They'll know. I mean, this is like like three or four scenes. And I love how like, he built up uh, Philippe's character as a person, technically, and you know, as a performer right. and and as a human. Um, there, there were so many elements that Papa Rudy brought to him. Every single time he was on the like five scenes, every single time he was on the screen, like I was completely engaged mm-hmm. and completely believed everything he said. He could have told me this guy was green. I'm like, that's right, Papa Rudy. Yep. Tell me about it. You're this guy's absolutely green. Right. It must be. It must be. <laughs> so, right. This this film it, it had a budget of 35 million. Um, as of right now, as of October, today's the. I don't know what date today. 16th. 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 Oh, my dates. But uh, the m- most recent numbers that I have, worldwide, it's accumulated up to 14 million. Um, foreign is over 7 million. And so worldwide right now, we're 14, 15 million. That's not including um, all the PNAs that went into all this. So budget's 35 so budget million, there, not including P- P- PNA. Print so and there's at least another. <laughs> Probably million sure. in yeah. there. Sure. So we're talking about a movie that probably minimum has been spent sixty five million dollars on it. Bargain. Minimum. Bargain. Especially because they've been advertising yeah. pretty heavy, so and three really bump that but, but up. Still by today's standards, a three D movie like today's like you know, blockbuster standards, I mean sixty five million is like that's like, you know, that's Will Smith's lunch. Do it's you, it's you know? not a lot. It's it's yeah. definitely not a lot. Um, especially talking about the effects that are used in this. Mm-hmm. However, bringing in only fifteen million, unless they pull through with a ton of award nominations, it's yeah. not looking too. I, great. I didn't it's, check how it's done internationally. I mean, I would, I would imagine it, it, it's internationally. The, 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 what hurts this film is the two things that hurt this film is the fact that, like, yeah, I think you really have to. It's been relies heavily on the three D. So if you're not seeing an IMAX or three D, and it's not as many IMAX or three D theaters around, and B, like people have an aversion to three D. Like sometimes the, before there's an I think, and people are like, I'm not seeing it in three D. I don't care about that movie. So people don't want to see it. And then last but not least. It's expensive. I went to the Chinese theater. That shit cost me forty bucks. And people tickets. just spend well, all their money. Yeah. It's, it's not people just already spent money on yeah, Everest. It's not just, just 3D to carry this movie. It's also performance and acting and story. Granted, this is a, in a way, a heist movie. But there's no explosions. There's no sex. There's no killing. There's there's a yeah. lot of it's PG. There's a lot of Hollywood elements that we're so kid, used really, to that to aren't in this film. So do you think this movie has the legs and strength to? bring its money back or no. like carry it through the test I'm, of time? I'm hoping that perhaps this will be a word of mouth movie. Yeah. And that people will too. go again. Because I I'd, would I'd actually I would actually see it again. And if if you're out there and you haven't and maybe you've seen it in the regular format and you're thinking, I don't know, did I miss something? Maybe go for it in the three D if it doesn't, you know, make you feel wonky. Yeah. Because yeah. it's real it's it's impressive. I'll and go it, see it's, the last half of it. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's and I think some people were thrown off by how good the effects look, like in the in the advertising, because I think some people were thinking, Oh no, if I go see it in three D it will make me feel sick. Right. And there were so, some people, there were some, I definitely had some people in my theater that were like vertigo y and like. There's whoa, been a lot whoa, of whoa, articles groaning. about it, people yeah. who did not do well. I felt fine and. Do you have any. But I don't have heights? any. I don't have. Yes. You do? So, yeah. Mm, okay. Oh, interesting. But not, interesting. Not, not, a, not a strong. Not a strong. Fear. <laughs> like yeah. a rational fear of heights? Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Not yeah. like his friend. No. 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 But I think anyone would probably feel that way, though. Anyway, kind of overcame I cannot go anywhere near the top of buildings. I I don't have a fear of heights. Like, I've bungee jumped. I've done all sorts of stuff. But, like, if there's a building, I don't want to get close to the edge. (laughs) I could get knocked off by some (laughs) gusty giant wind. I don't have a fear of heights, but I will will say, every time I'm in New York and I go, when I'm in any building, but, like, even this time (laughs) I was in the Empire State Building, like, it's, you know, you can't help but be, when you're in New York and you're that high, you can't help but, like, have a feeling of anxiety. And that's that's what I felt. That's what I feel when I'm up there and I'm always like, Ugh, what the? <laughs> but, but there's a safety of seeing a film. Do you know, logically, right. you're in the chair. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, but on a, on, a, on a quick personal note, I used to live in New York for almost five years before I moved out to L.A., mm-hmm. and my husband and I got married across the river from New York, so we had the view of the Freedom Tower, and so and we could see the Statue of Liberty, and then the, and then we didn't even know that they were going to show Paris, and we went to Paris on our honeymoon. Oh, it's and, and oh, you know. So we were just sitting there like, oh, oh, oh my God. So I, 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 I loved it already because of just like personal experience. And and but but so I was going in like wanting to just be excited about it and love it, and so maybe I wasn't as critical because I, I have I have you a skewed view so, uh, a little bit of everything. But yeah, he's a tightrope walker and your guitar player. No, you yeah, yeah. In the streets. And, then, and oh yeah, well yeah yeah. <laughs> that one? Okay, so I just had so, to add that in because my my opinion may be a little bit. Um, yeah, so you were yeah. left on a positive note yeah. with this, Joe. Yeah. Last thoughts for you. Uh, well, you know, I think we had like three minutes, and I think, uh, I just thought it was, I think mean, that was a fantastic movie. I encourage people to really see it. Uh, with, with technology, you can probably, if you have all the right equipment, you can see it at home in 3D, blah, blah, but you really need to be seeing the big screen. I recommend IMAX. I do recommend 3D. Uh, I think it's just a wonderful movie, you know, on its own, a wonderful adult movie with, you know, no, no explosion, no violence, but it's just a good, good movie, good, good heist movie, and a good, a good, a lot of fun. And you yeah. can, you can bring kids, I would say, from like third grade up. They can handle yeah. it. It's not oh, absolutely. Heights. Yeah. It's not Sorry, of heights. Um, I will say that the way Zemeckis depicted the towers and him walking on the wire was beautiful and engaging and did make me woozy in a little bit of a good way. Um, <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt did also a really good job. There are strong acting performances in it. But for me, if I was going to watch this movie again... I might just walk in halfway through and be like, oh, I need to feel this feeling again. Um, because some of the other story elements weren't un- there enough for me. I enjoyed it fine going through it. Sure. The star uh-huh. part is The Wire, which is what this movie is about. So he did that mission well. Yeah. Okay. What I loved was like this movie, and yes, a, a French man pulled this off, but I, I loved how it was taking place in America mm-hmm. and in New York and the land of possibilities. The message that we yep. can take from this is that like America is the land of opportunity yep. and dreams and executing them no matter how much time and effort you put into or it. how many yeah. laws and you have to break. Left, yeah, anyone can legally yeah. hang their wire and, anywhere and break a thousand laws. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it painted New York in a very positive light and right. just the story and the World Trade Center in a very positive light. So I was left with a very great feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a story I didn't really know well, but now I do. Right. And and it's also our current generation, you know, right now we know the, the Twin Towers, the tragedy of it, but now we know another positive story to go with it. Yeah. I'm going to hang so. my wire from here to here. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say from that wall to that, that wall. wall. There we go. There we go. All <laughs> right. Mark the five feet above the table. <laughs> so where can everyone keep following you to talk about movies in general, how much you love Zemeckis? And oh, me? Oh, yeah. You, you, you can do. find me on um, Twitter and Instagram and Periscope at Joe K. Braswell. You can also find me on our sister networks, BHL, 
uh, doing a show called Geek Nerd Tech. We talk about geek news and nerd culture, and also on After Buzz TV, doing the Blacklist with my Ooh. friends Joe and Julia. Yeah, woohoo, Amanda! You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at the Runway Queen, and you can find me on After Buzz TV discussing Project Runway. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank the you. first time I get to do this because yeah. I have a Twitter now. Sarah got a Twitter, Ooh. you guys! Yeah. Crazy. Hashtag no Sarah got a Twitter. Yeah, um, my hashtag is now gone, so now <laughs> I have at Sarah underscore Stretton. And right now I'm doing other popcorn talk shows and not made of movies typically and box office breakdown. Um, and then you can find me, you know, around. Yeah. And you can follow all of us at the popcorn talk on Twitter. Check out all of our other shows and sister networks here. We do so many we cover all different aspects of film. You can follow me on Twitter at Serafini TV. Thank you all for listening and you know let us know what you thought of this film of the story of Robert Zemeckis and how he took away this film and how he executed. Thank you all for listening and we will see you next time. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie.